as you can imagine, this is a very difficult time, so you will understand. If we are a bit emotional. First of all, I would like to say on behalf of the family, a huge thank you to everyone who has supported George and us through this traumatic time. In particular to Professor Williams and to Akhil, who have become firm friends as well as medical advisors to George. Because of the fact he had been in intensive care for so long, I was prepared for his death. Um, I was very strong throughout that entire period, probably stronger than anyone, possibly with the exception of my father, who's an amazing man anyway. Um, I'm not saying that I found it easy, but I found a strength and it got me through it. feeling of pride and a and reaction of the people to George's death. I mean, that was a, a wet, miserable November day, and, and you know, the people turned out in their thousands. to see it was, and it, 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 gave, us, it gave me a feeling, I, I, I was sad, but I was proud. See him walking through that door. I was born and reared on Newton Arts Road. I was born in 1919, and I was brought up for what people would call it the Depression years, when there was no work anywhere, virtually in Belfast. We didn't have very much, but what, what we had was kept clean and tidy, and you were taught manners and you were taught respect for people. Dickie Best lived in East Belfast right through the years of the Second World War, and as the conflict neared its end, romance beckoned in the shapely form of Anne Withers. We met at the Willowfield Dance Hall in the Woodstock Road. She caught my eye and I didn't know what I had caught her eye. I, but I was only a little touch, obviously. I didn't think it would have been interested in somebody like me, but apparently I was wrong. <laughs> George was born, he was born 11 months after we got married. And um, we had our name down with the housing trust as it was then, for a, a home of our own. So we eventually got that. George was about two and a half. We moved in there in 1949, so I'm still in the same house. That famous house in the Craig estate was where baby George soon began to show his true colours. Well, he was fascinated by a boy, but instinctively he seemed to know that it was meant to kick. Whatever I say, river colour, and even if it had been a rugby ball, he was still a kick it. I took photographs of him using an old Kodak box camera. 15, 16 months of age, he would have been. And he just seemed so not in the photographs. He had the balance, concentration, head down over the ball. And then, of course, as a few years went by, I started to encourage him to kick with the other foot. He looked at me and I said, kick with the other foot. And he can't, but then I was able to show him, you know, right, left, right, things like that. And I just said to him, well, if you want to be a footballer, that's what you have to do. We had that green area at the end of my street, and you would have seen him, even in wet days, 
op en dagen når det fejl, rejt fejl, lær fejl, juggling, jenking, you know. And he did that all on his own, just practice, practice, practice. So he, no matter how good he was, he, he seemed to want to get better. And as I always say, he was born with a good name. <laughs> George was six, I think, when I was born. Uh, George was the eldest, obviously, followed by my sister, Carol. I think there's about uh, 15 months between Carol and George, and then I came along. The happiest memories that I have would be of the three of us all clowning about in the house, and George was always a bit of a character, and he was, he was always so funny, and he was always up to mischief, and Carl and him used to fight all the time, and he, he was just a bit of a character. He was always a bit of a character with a great sense of humour. He did 11 plus, and he went to the Grosvenor High School when it was on the Grosvenor Road. They played rugby. Actually, they had played him apparently at wing three quarter and a couple of t things, and, and they were quite happy with him because he, he was game and he was fast and whatever. But he, he preferred the round ball. <laughs> and um, so he started missing days in school. So when that was discovered, they took the scholarship off him. And meanwhile, we went ahead and got him fixed up in this Nishara Secondary School. Once he went to listen to Shara, he never looked back because he was either always first or second in the classes. Although they didn't play compad in a competitive league, they still played football, they arranged friendly games and the like of that. But um, he, was, he was never happy, sort of, stale unless he had a ball he's told. With George now free to play football to his heart's content at home and at school, it wasn't long before his special talent for the game was noticed by one man in particular. Bob Bishop, he became the local scout and they were sent to Eric McMurdy across and um, Bob was looking for some other kids to go and he, he inquired from Bob McFarlane, there's any likely lads at Craigie there? And um, Bob said about George, and he always enthused about George. He had never any doubt in his mind that George was going to be something different. And he brought him up, raised a couple of trial matches, one of them against players two years older, and he was very impressed, sent him across. When him and Ike went aboard the boat that day, it was the first time Bertley had been out of Belfast beyond going to Bangor. I realised that something unusual was happening in the house. I mean, I obviously understood that George had been um, chosen to go off to, to have some trials for Manchester United. I understood that, but the, the thing which I remember vividly was the awful, awful sadness in the house. It was just, it was hard to describe. There was such an overwhelming sadness. I mean, there was my brother and obviously my mum and dad's firstborn child, only 15 years of age, going for us, it was such a long way away. I mean, we didn't get holidays. The furthest we got was Malile or Bangor or down to my granny's wee cottage in the countryside. But for, you know, our brother at only 15 to be going on this huge adventure and the sadness in the house that day was just, it was palpable. It was just, it was very difficult. To be obviously as a mother and I suppose as a father too, we knew that we would miss him. And tell you, in fact, I'll tell you the truth, on the first night that he went away, we both lay in bed and cried. But that first visit to Old Trafford didn't last very long. Just 36 hours, in fact. The two boys were missing home, and they decided to do something about it. I was on my summer holidays, and I was still in bed having a cup of tea. She was getting ready to go to work. And I heard her up the door, and then I heard the voice. I thought, that's George. So I hopped into my trousers, down the stairs. It was him. And I looked at him, I said, what are you doing here? He says, it's homesick. I said, well, don't worry about it. He says, you've done nothing wrong, nothing to be ashamed of. So then he gave me a slip of paper of his pocket to Armstrong. Please ring. He was the chief scout at Old Trafford. I said, what's the purpose of the call? He said, well, we're disappointed. The boys didn't give it a better chance. But we've seen your boy was, we'd like them to come back for another try. If he would. I said, well, if he does, he comes if he's on accord. I won't be putting pressure on him. I come back. Bought my paper and come back. 
and we were having a cup of tea across a wee folding table, and I was, I was flicking through the paper, pretending I was reading, but not really, and waiting for the inevitable question. It came up, what did Mr Armstrong want? I said, well, they're disappointed. I said, they don't want you back. And I seen a change in his expression, and I thought, he doesn't like that. His pride's hurt or something. I couldn't, I couldn't really explain what it was, but I knew something wrong. So I folded the paper, I opened the paper again, and then I folded it and I said to him, over the top of the folded paper, they do want you back. When? I said, no. You have to wait and think about it. No, I want to go back. A few weeks later, George plucked up the courage to return by himself to Manchester United. This time, the club had learnt its lesson and made sure that he found a proper home from home with Mrs Filloway, the landlady who practically became his second mum. I do know that for a, at least a year he fought homesickness. I do know that. But um, he stuck it out, so he did. And then, of course, he got to the stage where, where you couldn't get him to come home. <laughs> George threw himself into his football with passion and dedication, despite his loneliness. He signed, he signed three days before the FA Cup final against Leicester, and he wasn't in the team. He, he signed, uh, his birthday was in the middle of that week, and they signed him, and they had asked him to get me a ticket for the final, because I'd never been to Wembley at that stage. So he got me the ticket, but the club, very kindly at that time, they paid to fly me across and put me up for the weekend at their expense. Four months after his 17th birthday, he made his first team debut against West Bromwich Albion, having quickly caught the eye of Manchester United's legendary manager, Matt Busby. Well, from what reports that I heard from other players and all, he was one of the hardest trainers at the ground and one of the fastest as, as, as well. Three, come on, John, four, five, six, seven. No matter how good he was, he wanted to get better. I'll give you an example of that, which he only told me about a few years ago. When the rest of the players left after training, he stayed behind and he practiced taking corner kicks from the right wing with his left foot. Then he went to the left wing and he practiced taking corner kicks with his right foot and his target was the centre of the crossbar. Now that's dedication. It was obviously a very, a very short time after George left, uh, when he was only about 17, that he really started to hit the headlines. Our lives became very public. The press were up constantly at the door, the headlines in the press. Everybody wanted a little piece of George Best. I mean, he was he was big news. He was the, he was the first sort of superstar footballer. With the stage as famous as Old Trafford to play upon, it wasn't long before George Best, the boy from East Belfast was winning awards and making headlines for all the right reasons. Even in a team which boasted legendary stars such as Bobby Charlton and Dennis Law, it was Best's genius which stood out. And that's another thing too that makes me very proud about George. It was the respect he got from other players. Because Jim Baxter told me in his pub in Glasgow, George was the greatest player he'd ever seen or ever played against. Tommy Smith told, told me the same thing in Los Angeles. And he said, we used to be sent out to scare George, and we only wasted our so-and-so time. In 1968, he was crowned European Footballer of the Year. One thing I will say about him, he was a complete player. Because he had pace, he could pass a ball, he could fight for a ball. He could jump for a ball. In one game against Chelsea, Chopper Horace had brought him down, and as George was down, he pushed himself back off the ground, and the ball still in control at his feet. He rounded Horace, lifted his head, and he looked into the net. 
And of course, the famous Gordon Banks one, I mean, that was a goal. Banks threw the ball up and he just hooked it out of the air and bounced. George handed him in the net. Banks claimed he had been fouled. How do you decide which was George Best's greatest performance? Dickie Best has no doubt. Wearing the green shirt of Northern Ireland at Windsor Park, he faced a strong Scottish team. George took, but he took the whole Scottish team on his own at times. He didn't score because Ronnie Simpson played out of his skin, Scottish goalkeeper. George would have scored six, seven or eight, and not much only for Simpson. Simpson was terrific. That goal he scored against Benfica, the one where he jumped, he went up between the two defenders and headed it down. It was the second leg of the semi final. Matt had told him to go out and play it a bit defensively for the first 20 minutes, get yourself settled down. But one of the papers reported that George must have heard him because he scored two in the first seven minutes. And he came back with a sombrero and he had the long hair of, you know, the Beatles style in those days. And there's a story, I'm not sure if people are aware of it, that um, after the game, one of the, the supporters from the opposition rushed towards him with a, was either a knife or a pair of scissors. And obviously George was horrified, but this chap just wanted a piece of his hair. He just wanted to cut off a piece of his hair. So yes, I think after that, I mean, George's life and our lives took on a totally different direction. Certainly from, from a family point of view, it was, it was a very surreal situation because we still knew him as our brother who'd gone away two years previously. And now here he was a superstar in the papers. Oh, daily, basically, after that. No footballer in Britain had ever been subjected to such adulation and attention before. George attracted crowds of adoring fans wherever he went. But there was a price to be paid for his fame, sometimes by members of his own family. Whether he'd had a good game or whether he'd had a new girlfriend, it didn't matter what George Best did, the press wanted to know about it. And they would have gone to any lengths, basically, to find out about it, including, you know, coming to our home and, you know, questioning us as, as children. And, you know, we were a bit naive in those days and you didn't really think, and sometimes you told them stuff. And, mind you, we learned very quickly not to. I asked them to keep the press out of the street at my mother's funeral because they thought George might be there. They intruded a bit in that. And I actually had to go up and t tell them in you know, uncertain terms to take themselves off that who the one to see wasn't there. Uh, and I, uh, but then I suppose they're doing their job under orders, and I suppose in many ways they do a good job. I mean, I, 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 I can't dispute that. I seldom spoke about George, really. I was really quite shy about speaking about him. However, there were many occasions where people, for whatever reason, best known to themselves, um, obviously didn't like the fact that I had a brother with this fame and they would have been quite difficult about it sometimes. For example, I remember going to um, one of our local discos, as it was in those days, one evening, and a couple of people bumping into me and saying, oh, George Best's sister, you think you are something, but you're nothing but an orange bee. And then, I, obviously, I didn't rise because, you know, I was very shy and very nervous as well, and that was fine. The dance ended, the disco ended, and we went outside, and I heard someone shouting, there she is there, and the next thing I felt this horrendous pain in the inside of my right leg, and basically, to cut a long story short, I'd been shot in the leg by an air rifle. George Best reached the height of his fame as a footballer in 1968, when he helped Manchester United to beat the mighty Benfica in the final of the European Cup. On that euphoric night at Wembley, no one suspected how quickly it would all turn sour. After they won the European Cup in 68, the team, they were all getting on a bit in years, and they started deteriorating a bit and George wasn't happy with the situation, and then when they were in this, into the second division, as it was known at that time, he was very unhappy about that. And um, he just, he thought that the club weren't doing enough for them to get them back on their feet. 
he did the runner. He was to he was to play against Chelsea and and funny Chelsea came into George's life quite a, a lot, but. He, he, he was to play against Chelsea and he did a runner and he rang me and told me he was coming home. He just decided that he wasn't going back at all and he went to America. But then he came back from America and uh, Tommy Daugherty had taken over at that time and he got George Cox to sign again, which he did. And he told him he didn't care what he did in his private life as long as he turned up for training. And George didn't turn in on a Thursday. They were to play Plymouth in one of the rounds of the cup. Plymouth were a third division side or something at the time. And when George arrived on Saturday, he wasn't on the team sheet and he asked why and Daddy said he didn't train on a Thursday. He said I did, but I didn't come in the morning, come in the afternoon. He said, Well you're not playing anyhow. And then George said, Well if I'm not fit to play against Plymouth, he said I won't be back and he walked out and he never went back. Some of the, the press reports were quite vicious and it was very, very difficult to deal with, especially from my mum's point of view. Um, that was her first first son. And then, you know, obviously, my father, that's, that's their child. George was in the headlines. I can't remember what the incident was, but George was yet again headline news and our family home was bombarded by press. We used to have to sit with the Venetian blinds closed, you know, just to try and get a bit of privacy. And I remember at that stage, um, a young reporter coming to the door and my mum, and it's well documented that my mum was an alcoholic, you know, it's, and she'd had a few wee drinks that night and I was trying to keep her away from the press, but nothing would do. She had to come to the door and I'm trying to keep her behind the door and she's trying to open the door and this young lad's trying to get information out of me. And eventually my mum, you know, spoke to him and she, words ensued and she was, she was very upset and he basically turned around and said to her, well, what would you know? You're nothing but a drunk, and if it wasn't for the likes of us, your son wouldn't be where he was today. During the really bad times with my mum, when Carl would have phoned George begging him to come home, he would have said, yes, darling, yes, darling, I'll be in the plane, you know, I'll be home tomorrow, the day after. And and he, he didn't come for whatever reason, we don't know, but on reflection, it probably was the start of his own alcohol problems. She had had two previous heart attacks, and then she got over those to a degree. And then her and I, because of the way the situation had went, we drifted apart a little bit. And I was sort of sleeping downstairs. She was sleeping in the bed. And I used to take her a cup of tea before I went to work. And I took her up a cup of tea. And she was dead. She had died in her sleep. And I always, I always regretted that that, that um, I hadn't been with her in the true sense of being a couple in the last week of her life. I think it had an impact on him. I think it saddened him. There again, he didn't speak about my mum's death very much. But I have no doubt in my mind that he carried perhaps some guilt over the fact that he, he wasn't here as much as he could have been. I didn't sort of like pursue him in any way because I thought it was better for if he wanted or needed me, I was there. And I, you thinking yet? But I think he had that sort of independence within himself too. George's mother died at the age of 54 in 1978, four years after he played his last game for Manchester United. As Anne's struggle with alcohol reached its tragic conclusion. George's own struggle began in earnest. As his troubles on and off the pitch multiplied, he began to drink more and more heavily. George was his own person and he did his own thing and you could never have tried to dictate to him what to do. I mean, he was an alcoholic. He had huge problems overcoming it. He tried everything, in my opinion, humanly possible to overcome it. and. Yes, I used to get a little bit frustrated with him, a little bit angry with him, but by the same token, I used to get 
equally frustrated with the press because they latched on to every little story which they could and they blew it out of all proportion. Everything was front page news when it came to George. There were good times in there as well, but however, the bad times when they were bad, I think had a profound effect, not just on myself, but on the rest of the family, and in particular my father. He had to, you know, sit in the house and put up with all of this, and, you know, the press would ring, and my father's not really very tolerant of the press, and no comment, put the phone down. But it, nevertheless, it was very, very difficult. The thing I had against him was the way they tried to castigate George over his drink problem because they set themselves up as judge, jury and executioner. And, uh, and then, because he got his liver transplant, uh, there was a, a two in particular that weren't very happy about that. And there was one of them actually some time ago, through George's agent offered me quite a big sum of money for the new story. And uh, I then felt he tried to see if they would increase it. But it wouldn't have mattered even if they doubled it, and my answer was going to still be no. I'll always be proud of him because um, I understand his drink problem better than maybe most people would do. But, but because I used to go to open AA, open meetings in the Shaftesbury Square Hospital, which deals with all addictions, and Dr. Mary had the chief authority there, he would have told you that you don't know when you take your first ever drink where it's going to lead. And the second thing I impressed on you was that alcohol is a drug. And there's nobody sets out to be an alcoholic. George was his own man, and he once said to me, if he wanted a drink, he could get a drink anywhere. I wasn't going to preach to George, I wasn't going to pontificate to him. I didn't enjoy seeing him drinking. But we could only watch him drink and try to do our very best to make sure that he didn't come to any harm. An example of it might be whenever he was going through a bit of a bad spell down in uh, Porto Vogue and we had a phone call to say that he was in a particular establishment. And Barbara and I drove down there and he had actually moved on from that one to another. And I walked into this establishment and he was sitting there on his own with a bottle of wine. And I simply said to him, George, don't you know this isn't doing you much good? And he said, yes, mate, I know. And I said, uh, shall we go? And he says, OK. Now, that's about the only time that I broached the subject with him. I would say the very, very worst thing that you could do with George Best was to say to him, George, you're not going to drink. During the time when George was drinking, he I don't think he looked to anyone for moral support. He, he was his own man. He was an alcoholic. He couldn't help what he did. He tried other means of, of support, you know, from a medical point of view, but certainly from a, an emotional point of view. He, he never certainly spoke to me about it or he didn't look to me for any sort of support. I wish he had it and I wish I could have given it, but however, it just wasn't his nature. By July 2002, George's health was in serious decline. The years of such heavy drinking had finally taken their toll and it became obvious that only one thing might save him a liver transplant. He had no options left. He'd reached the end of the road. He, he was so ill that uh, a liver transplant was the only way of saving his life. Of course, yes, he was, you know, he was very failed and he was, he was very weak and, you know, it took a long time to sort of to get his strength back. But considering the enormity of the operation and what he had actually gone through, he came through it remarkably well. Sadly, after the operation, it was barely a year afterwards when George succumbed to the evils again of drink. I think constantly about what alcoholism is, 
what causes this problem and why can a person, why is it not just so simple, why can't they stop drinking? But the only thing which I can compare it to is trying to stop smoking and looking what George went through um, the last couple of years. You know, it must have been so difficult for him. So, I mean, if getting a liver was not enough to stop George, given the fact how ill he was during the actual operation and how he very nearly didn't make that, you know, it, I don't have the answers to it. It was the autumn of 2005, and, as we now know, it was the beginning of the end. When George first went into intensive care, we visited him, and I'm afraid the alarm bells were ringing even then. He could barely speak. He was very weak. He wasn't in bed. He was actually out of bed, but there was just something there, and I'll never forget we left him, and he tried to shout across the screen, you know, bye, darling, but he was just so weak. And whenever we left, we both had the most awful feeling. We tried to remain optimistic, but he looked so ill that we were both very, very concerned. It was eight weeks in total in intensive care, and obviously statistics prove that the longer you're in intensive care, the less chance that you have coming out of it. And I knew deep down in my heart that it wasn't looking good. Even on days when I spoke to Phil and he said, yeah, he's a little bit better, he had a spoonful of porridge or some little minor, minor detail, I struggled daily to, to be optimistic. When we were at his bed, say that uh, last day and night, I was actually saying, trying to transmit my thoughts to him, George, let go. You know, because uh, and I, he wasn't he wasn't in agony according to what they said. He, he wasn't having any pain or anything. But you know, we all spoke in his ear and whatever, including Doctor Lisa. He he did the same thing as we did. So it was it was very very genuine the whole thing. My father, during George's last hours, just remained his his dignified self. He sat on George's right-hand side. I sat on George's left-hand side with Callum. Um, and he just sat there. Every now and again, I would look at him. I, tr I, you know, I didn't look at Dad because, you know, it would have set me off. You know, he was watching his son, really, in the last hours of his life. And, you know, he, he spoke to him the odd occasion. Suppose it's like everything, like, everything else in life, you've got to face up to it and accept it. I, I suppose the one consolation was that George didn't die alone and uh, he didn't die an agonising death, or at least as far as we've been told by the hospital, he was in no pain. But I suppose it got, we just had to accept it, that it was, it was over. This is a statement on behalf of the family, and we would prefer at this stage not to take questions. As you can imagine, this is a very difficult time, so you will understand. If we are a bit emotional. It was difficult. However, because of the fact he had been in intensive care for so long, I was prepared for his death. Um, I was very strong throughout that entire period, probably stronger than anyone, possibly with the exception of my father, who's an amazing man anyway. Um, I'm not saying that I found it easy, but I found a strength and it got me through it. I would like to say something now to you people, and I hope you listen and, and follow what I was going to ask you to. Now we've made a statement to you would you please all go away and leave us to grieve in peace? I thought enough was enough, and we want to be left alone to grieve, in our, as any family would be, would, would want to be. And I just ask him, would you please go away? That George and I go on. Would you I please go away and leave us to grieve in peace? And that's just a human request. It was the beginning of one hell of a week. Um, 
it's it was just the most amazing week. He he had a send off way beyond our expectations, and I'm sure way beyond his own expectations. I firmly believe that he would never have envisaged that sort of a send off, and it's something which I doubt the world will ever see again. For a, for a, a football for a, a, a sporting hero, it was just unbelievable. From the Sunday right the way through to the day of the funeral, it was just meeting after meeting with police, with the RAF, with the funeral directors, with the uh, protocol people, with, with such a variety of people to ensure this was going to be carried off with the aplomb that it deserved. One thing... Um, one thing which will stick with me was that uh, uh, there was a phone call to uh, Barbara's dad's house from uh, Peter Hayne's office, and they said to us, whatever you want, uh, you can have. And for a person like me from a very ordinary background, being, being, being put in a position of being able to call upon resources from across the spectrum for six days, was really, really outstanding but strange. One major thing will stick with me was uh, going there in the cars and what you do is to practically feel the emotion coming from the people who were standing at the side of the road. You, you, you could practically touch it. Here's the sun we have all I had a, a great feeling of pride and the reaction of the people to George's death. I mean, that was a, a wet, miserable November day. And, and the other people turned out in their thousands. How soon they fly on and on And I am old And will be good. It gave me a feeling I, I was sad, but I was proud. Today the world is saying goodbye to Dr. George Best, superstar, superhero. Today I am saying goodbye to GB, super brother, my hero. My love and respect for you, GB, was unconditional and simple. I wasn't speaking in front of the whole world. I was speaking in front of one person, for one person. And I know I wavered a bit, but the rest of the world, I was there for him. I will always cherish the memories of the many happy times that I was privileged to share with you. And I will be grateful to Norman, or Storman as you fondly refer to him as, for encouraging me all those years ago to make more of an effort to become part of your life. I had to do it. I just, I had to let him know. Today, George, the long road has brought you home. Goodbye, GB, and thank you. My contribution was to George to tell him that I loved him, something that I had never told him, but that was my way of telling him. He is only a boy. You can George's funeral was for the ordinary people. It wasn't for the great and the good. They came and they enjoyed, but it was for the ordinary people. In our hearts, here. And he got what he wanted. Remember me for my football. And that's what they did that day.
I think it was shortly into the new year that they started to speak about renaming something after George. The family were approached about absolutely every project which was, was put to them and our wishes were sort of paramount in everybody's mind. The airport just jumped out at us because for us it was an airport that was for all of the people from Northern Ireland. We couldn't have been seen to have been favouring one side of the community to the other. The airport was just so appropriate and with I think it's something like three million people flying into Belfast City now, it was just our favourite. What a fitting tribute uh, for George to have the airport of his home city called after him. The murals which are going up in Belfast are a brilliant idea. Uh, George had respect for everyone regardless of their class, colour and creed as my father would, he would bear testimony to that too. And to have George's face on a wall as opposed to a paramilitary one can only be progress. The George Best Foundation had to be it was a chance remark by Professor Williams the day of the funeral when he saw the organisational skills which had been shown in getting it put together. It just said, Norman, and you have to do something. You know, you've got to, to grasp this. We both work at it very, very hard for the very best of reasons. At the moment, we, we have two aims and objectives. The one is obviously the research into liver disease and the other is youth football to promote a healthy lifestyle through football two of George's biggest passions. He was a man of great personal charm, of great uh, generosity. He was a man who had a particular skill that if he happened to meet somebody once, they would remember that for the rest of their days. And in fact, how many people have you heard say I, I was a good friend of George Best, and they perhaps only met him once because he had this sheer uh, charisma about him that made people feel they were his friend. He was patient, he was tolerant, he was kind, he was funny. His fame didn't, in my opinion, change him as a person. He always, always remained a very humble person. Oh yes, George could go and, and socialise with kings and queens and presidents, and that, which he has done, but he was equally comfortable in his local pub playing cribbage with his old friends. Footballers go away. I think no matter where the, the subject crops up, George will be remembered as one of the, the greats. And that's not me just saying that. That is that has been shown, proved in many ways. But uh, I'd like him to be, to be remembered as a down to earth bloke who didn't make a big deal of who he was and what he was. And another thing that, I, that I'm proud of about George is that he had no nothing against people because of their uh, class, colour or creed. That is one of the things that I'm very proud of him for as well. I'd like to see him walking through that door. 